All right, seasons one and two of The Simpsons are done. The secondary characters have been introduced, they've cleaned up the animation, tweaked the tone and pacing of the show. Now where do they go next? This is the fundamental challenge of season three. Before we get started, I want to note that season three includes two holdover episodes, part of the previous production cycle. I'm writing this from the point of view of the audience experiencing the evolution of the show. Therefore, I am including them because they affect our perception of the overall flavor of Season 3. But it's worth noting this transitory period between TV seasons. So anyway, in a lot of respects, Season 3 feels like the very first sequel season of the show. Where it's not necessarily about building the foundation of what it is anymore, most of that has been completed. It's more the evolution of established elements, or reiterations of past concepts. The innovation is less about the new, more about the change. For example, last time we went through a lengthy list of new important characters introduced in Season 2. It's like over a dozen people. For this season, it's Kirk and Luann, Fat Tony's gang, and Lunch Lady Doris. And that's basically the list. This year is more about adding depth and changing up the formula. First, let's look at the secondary characters and how they changed. Season 3 put emphasis on featuring more characters in larger roles. We get follow-up episodes from some of our previously established favorites. Mr. Burns, Ned Flanders, and Selma each get another go-round. Arguably, Krusty falls into this too, since he got a Season 1 highlight. But Season 3 branches out and gives episodes to people like Moe, Edna Krabappel, and Bart's friend. In the cases of Moe and Edna, I wouldn't say they appear more often in Season 3. We just see different sides of their personalities particularly their personal lives. I would argue one of the biggest breakout characters of Season 3 is Bart's friend, however. If you love Bart's friend, Season 3 is the place to be. They'll devote the B-plot of Homer Defined to Bart's friend's parents not approving of Bart. He'll show up for the dinner with Krusty. Bart's friend will get abandoned at the rock concert. Culminating in his featured episode, Millhouse Falls in Love. Granted, we also get a bunch of Nelson throughout, and Martin provides the most hilariously weird joke of the year, but Season 3 put most of its work into establishing these two as a duo. Also, before I leave the kids, Ralph is around but is still a work in progress. Speaking of which, Chief Wiggum is another one of the biggest winners of Season 3. Bart the Murderer discovered that following this guy around leads to wacky fun, and therefore we see a bunch of his incompetence and thoughtlessness throughout. Characters like Apu and Groundskeeper Willie participate in more of the plots, establishing some key characteristics we love today. The writers seem to fall in love with the idea of Principal Skinner serving in Vietnam, scattering references all over the final few episodes. Patty and Selma probably have the strongest defamation case against Season 3. This is not a very kind year to them. They're always kind of a buzzkill in the past, I suppose. Here's where the writers really leaned into how gross they are to live with, how sex with Selma is disgusting, how Patty won't tell Marge where Homer is. Maybe season 3 just struggles with writing the Bouvier women. I feel like Marge is another one of the biggest losers in terms of characterization. On my season 2 rewatch, I appreciated her subtle manipulation and her general give em hell attitude. However, the Season 3 Marge falls into an extremely passive, domestic role in most plots. In many episodes, she's either just worrying about what's happening, or even nagging the plot. Or she's just being put upon by others. Her Spotlight episode revolves all around how everyone just dumps on her, and doesn't appreciate what she does. Later seasons made sure to give her more active stuff, like the Monorail episode, Going on the Lamb, or Becoming a Cop. Marge mostly got stuck in the house in Season 3, which is honestly pretty disappointing. With Bart, they don't really lean into the self-reflection stuff as much with him. A lot of his material tends to revolve around pranks and general mischief. Think about his schemes in Bart the Murderer, Radio Bart, and Bart the Lover as examples. His stories tend to conclude with Bart either fixing or paying for his past mistakes. Bart does get a few different looks overall toward the end of the year, though. Lisa was written very bookishly in Season 3. There should be a drinking game for every time she's either reading something or writing in her log. Her brightiness has mostly disappeared at this point. She and Bart have settled into being more partners in crime rather than bickering antagonists. 
She's starting to get more into the big issues, start calling out people when the plot needs it. They're still careful to write in some childishness into her, even letting her hang out with Janie or having a sleepover. The writers also discovered what a good character duo Lisa and Homer is around this time. You can see this dynamic sprinkled into a ton of episodes. Homer continued his downward intellectual descent in Season 3 as expected. The special focus of this year seemed to be his incompetence at work. He gets fired in both the Treehouse of Horror special and Burns for Coffender Craftwork. Homer Defined was all about how bad he is at his job. Speaking of which, I probably should have mentioned earlier that Lenny and Carl are other big winners of this season, due to the emphasis on power plant storylines. Back to Homer again, if it's not workplace stuff, season 3 hammers home what a screw-up he is, how he seems to make the wrong life decision at every moment. They let him be good at softball, and that's about it. Homer basically ruins the family's lives financially in three different episodes. If there's any overarching theme of Season 3, it's money. Money drives, like, over half of the plots. Usually not in a positive way for the Simpson family, although there are a couple times the writers throw him a bone. Other characters like Flanders, Otto, and Unky Herb run into huge financial problems they have to overcome. Characters like Mr. Burns and Moe enjoy huge windfalls. Selma almost gets murdered for her money. Season 3 is a very working class sort of season. It makes sense that money tends to make the plots go around. From a structural standpoint, Season 3 moved away from the more classical and straightforward plots and toward incorporating B-plots and converging storylines. With B-plots, we went from 1 in Season 1, 2 in Season 2, jumping up to 4, arguably 5, in Season 3. In addition, they have four more episodes that have sort of parallel plots that converge in the end. This can sometimes result in slightly simpler story arcs than previous offerings. On the plus side, we haven't really reached the point where they go all over the place and forget where they came from. Arguably, only the auto show is guilty of this. Some episodes actually feature some of the slickest Act 1 callbacks in the history of the series. Man, this is well done. At the beginning of the video, I described Season 3 as the first sequel season. That's partially due to the amount of continuity infused into their story selections. For example, Krusty Gets Busted gets directly referenced two separate times, even showing old clips. The episode splits off the Bart Krusty stuff into Like Father Like Clown, and the Bart Sideshow Bob stuff into Black Widower. Black Widower is also a follow-up to what they started in Principal Charming. Herb Powell returns for his sequel episode, the flashback in I Married Marge continues the story from The Way We Was. Or it continues from That 90s Show, the future prequel episode set in Season 3's present decade. Then you have sort of thematic sequels, where there are variations on relationships we already explored. Like how Lisa substitutes parent-child dynamic gets played straight in Lisa's Pony, and then inverted in Lisa the Greek. Homer and Flanders gets revisited, Mr. Burns and Santa's Little Helper get theirs. I'm not calling Season 3 out for being formulaic or uncreative. We're starting to reach the point where certain character dynamics are really clicking. It would be pretty stupid of them to not revisit stuff and figure out what makes them tick. If you've just discovered a character like Mr. Burns, would you really skip over him? If you said yes to this, I will be sending you five pages of network notes shortly. I would argue that the real innovation of Season 3 is more stylistic in nature. It's more about the nuts and bolts of how scenes are sequenced together in a script, how they present certain jokes, what kind of direct references they actually go for. This is the first change in showrunners in the series' history, handing over the reins from the trio of Matt Groening, James L. Brooks, and Sam Simon over to the team of Al Jean and Mike Reese. These two ran Seasons 3 and 4, and then went on to create The Critic. The Critic has a reputation for being very referential, very heavy on movie parodies and stuff. You can certainly see the germs of The Critic in their two years running The Simpsons. They ramped up how much more TV the characters watch. They are more apt to name drop and comment on real world references. Like Bart quoting Sammy Davis Jr., the family participating in Hands Across America, or just straight up playing Monopoly. Twice even. The jokes become slightly less about what's happening in the plot, 
they're more like drag and drop elements that can easily transition somewhere else. Do you remember what episodes these two jokes came from? Like, just as another exercise, let's look at how many season 3 episodes open with something referential, either a parody or just them watching TV. We have the USA Today parody in Homer Defined, the 2001 parody in Lisa's Pony, Troy McClure's infomercial in Saturdays of Thunder, Ion Springfield in Flaming Moe's, The Dance Show in Radio Bart, Watching Football in Lisa the Greek, The Zinc Film Strip in Bart the Lover, The Looney Tunes parody in Homer Alone, The Lottery Commercial in Dog of Death, Dinosaurs in Black Widower, and Indiana Jones in Bart's Friend Falls in Love. That's nearly half the episodes in the season. Now to be clear, I'm not criticizing this stylistic change. A lot of those moments are genuine classics, and the show would be way worse not having them. A lot of this stuff is what makes The Simpsons The Simpsons. It's just a good illustration of how the show changed between seasons 2 and 3. Season 3 inserts these kind of moments regularly in all three acts. You'll have itchy and scratchy cartoons start mirroring the theme of the episode, where the hold music selections will become bitterly ironic, where watching TV will affect the plot in significant ways. Oh, that's a perfect segue. We've been putting off this topic long enough on this channel, but we finally need to talk about sex. Sex appeal on The Simpsons, I mean. Compared to its early days, season 3 is a more consistently horny season of The Simpsons. I don't know if it's the show hitting adolescence or what, but it always seems to be lusting after the ladies, you know? Throwing in small moments of fan service. Season 3 kinda needs to get laid. Some people might think that observation is unwarranted, but I think that's a load of rich creamery butter. Notably, Season 3 does not really show off its male character's sexuality that much though. It's basically just Groundskeeper Willie. And after that, Lenny. If you're into Lenny, I guess this is alright. Anyway, aside from referential humor and general, uh, sexiness, Season 3 is really into list jokes. Here's where we get more and more montages. These sometimes move the plot along, like montages should, but they usually exist for delivering jokes. They're a nice vehicle for rattling off a quick series of related ideas. Montages continue to be a series staple until this present day. I would argue that Season 3's signature variation on this joke would be its usage of thought bubbles. There was a stronger tendency to stay in the scene we're in, and instead deliver the list joke as a series of visual thoughts. In later seasons, these thought bubbles tend to be just one idea, or else they'll cut away completely. Cutaway jokes have, in general, trickled into the series more and more. Season 3 isn't afraid to kick it somewhere else temporarily to show whatever they were talking about. It's not too over the top yet, Season 4 is going to push this dynamic much harder. Instead of strict cutaways, they tend to go for fantasy sequences and flashbacks. Now, the first two seasons certainly utilize these sort of moments to shake things up. They were noteworthy for playing with the color schemes and art styles. Season 3's fantasies continued this artistic trend in some cases, otherwise used them to heighten the absurdity of a situation. Like, the Season 2 Homer imagines an Algonquin Roundtable-esque version of past events. Season 3 Homer proudly covers himself in 14 karat gold. We're seeing the show's sense of humor move in a more absurd and surreal direction. I absolutely love how cuckoo bananas some of these moments are. I mean, the land of chocolate is here. How could this be a bad thing? In terms of its guest stars, Season 3 pushed the envelope on having more celebrities play themselves instead of characters. Funnily enough, this specific era seemed to make that decision based on what the celebrity does for a living where most of their athletes and singers play themselves, or a version of themselves, and if they bring in an actor like Jackie Mason or Beverly D'Angelo, they'll always play an original character. I don't really mind the balance of celebrities at this point, it's not too over the top or anything yet. It just makes Springfield feel a little more Hollywood, that the show is becoming more self-aware about its success. This is a world now where Magic Johnson could call you on the phone. You can certainly see the Hollywood self-awareness in their usage of meta-jokes during this period. The Simpsons had kind of reached the point where they were like, Whoa, we made it! Isn't being on television weird? To be fair, Season 2 definitely did this a little bit. 
But here's where you get stuff like Homer calling out sleazy Hollywood producers, The Simpsons over merchandising themselves, complaining about being on crappy merchandise, or even thanking Bill Cosby for saving them. They'll make jokes about millions of kids sitting at home watching TV. Lisa will mention her appalling amount of TV. Luann will observe that they don't say the word sucks on TV. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that The Simpsons is getting a bit self-conscious at this point. Furthermore, the writers have started getting bored with certain series staples. We get three more prank calls from Bart, same as last season. However, each of these go in a slightly different direction, often making fun of the format itself. Obviously, this evolution is a very natural and important thing for a show to go through. The audience wouldn't put up with the same jokes year after year. The writers wouldn't want to write them. The jokes are slightly more self-aware now, sure, but it's more a consciousness about giving the audience something new. I think that's important. Overall, I always think of Season 3 as being a year about small stories with big jokes. They feature character-driven plots about relationships, sometimes featuring secondary characters, plots that don't typically explode into big angry mobs, or stories that include the greater Springfield area. But they sprinkle in these really big jokes throughout the stories, jokes that are almost inappropriately too silly for this down-to-earth premise, where a simple conversation will evoke the most insanely nonsensical daydreams, where celebrities will come in and hijack this straightforward plot. Now, I don't want to knock the later season's plots, like Deep Space Homer or Marge vs. the Monorail, where the ridiculous jokes mirror the ridiculous plot. Those are obviously great episodes. I just find Season 3's overall style slightly more interesting, how they juxtapose the ridiculous and the ordinary. The Simpsons go for this all the time. This is nothing unique to this era. I just think Season 3 is the king of this particular dynamic, where this concept was at the very core of everything they did. On a personal note, Season 3 has always been my sentimental favorite season of The Simpsons, even if it's not technically the strongest lineup they ever produced. Separate Vocations is the very first episode I distinctly remember watching all the way through. I have vague memories of scenes from Season 2, but this was the first episode where the whole thing fascinated me from beginning to end. Maybe it was just the cool usage of the Axel Foley theme, I don't know. Also, Season 3 was the first one I got on DVD as a random Christmas present, where I discovered the magical world of DVD commentaries, watched all the episodes over and over again, and reignited my love for the show. I honestly don't think this YouTube channel would exist if it weren't for that Season 3 DVD set. Also, because where else would I ever talk about this, but the commentaries for Season 3 are legitimately amazing. It's not just my nostalgic bias, I promise. You should listen to them. I recommend Stark Raving Dad and Homer at the Bat for the stuff about the guest stars, Black Widower to hear about them desperately trying to win an Edgar, Bart's friend falls in love for like the 60 people who showed up for that commentary, and maybe the best one is The Auto Show, weirdly enough, where they all seem kinda unimpressed and Dan Castellaneta sings Little Spanish Flea. Also they point out the animators drew bangs for everyone at the crowd sequence to avoid drawing so many pairs of eyes. You can never unsee this now. It's so hilarious. I could go on and on about these forever. They're such a funny and interesting set of commentaries. Anyway, enough commentary about commentaries. I'm going to end it right here and move on to doing the rankings for these episodes. I have a suspicion this list isn't going to be as difficult as Season 2. Let me know in the comments what you think of that Season 3 flavor. What separates it from Seasons 2 and 4? I feel it's somewhat challenging to make the natural and obvious conclusion that 3 is just a mixture of 2 and 4, since seasons 2 and 4 are such completely different animals. That's a weird mixture of elements. It's kind of a miracle this season didn't explode into an incoherent mess, looking back on it. Maybe season 3 is just season 2 with cough syrup, who knows. I'd be interested to hear your take on this era of the show. As always, thanks for watching.